Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. They're sisters. They're both PhDs in bilingual developmental psychology. They're both faculty members at CUNY. They're Puerto Ricans, born and raised in New York in the 1950s and 1960s. They're Nia Ricans. They're Angelo Anselmo, an ordained interfaith minister and a colleague of mine at Baruch, where she's the director of the SEEK program, and Alma Rubal Lopez, professor of education at Brooklyn College, and they've written a memoir on becoming New Yorkans. Welcome. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to see you, and it's a pleasure meeting you. What's a New Yorkan, and why are New Yorkans important? Alma. Well, New Yorkans, um, I define in the book as as a person who was born and brought up in New York from Puerto Rican descent, or a Puerto Rican who has moved to New York and has lived most of his life in New York and identifies himself as a New Yorkan. What makes a Puerto Rican a New Yorkan? I mean, is it is there anything definable about a New Yorkan? What is what is it about your New Yorkness that adds to your Ricanness? Well, in terms of my identity, I identify very uh, strongly with New York. The term New Yorkan really was created. Um, by um, those group of people who went back in the 60s. It was a back migration, and that happened to us. It was in 61, we went back a lot. That dream of uh, the original Puerto Ricans who came and raising their children and wanting to go back to the island. And when we went back to the island, we really didn't fit in. Um, and th they called us all oh, those New Yorkans. Okay, now, what I noticed in this was that you were really functioning in two worlds and in some senses outsiders in two worlds. There was the New York world where you were Puerto Ricans and you were outsiders because you were different. Because you weren't white and you weren't black, you sort of didn't fit. And then what was interesting, going back to Puerto Rico, you were not Puerto Rican, you were American, yeah, so... Gringos. You were gring yeah, I mean... <laughs> Gringas. How did you... How did that play psychologically? What... Living in these multiple worlds and not being, yeah. being part of them and not part of them. Well, I think the migration of the Puerto Rican is really the migration of the first group of people to New York who could not be categorized as black or white mm -hmm. or... Um, of one culture because of our political status. We basically had ties to the island and because of technology. We were not that Italian from Northern Italy who everybody came to say goodbye and they cried because they were never gonna see that person again. You could fly back. Exactly, and we had telephones and we could talk to to our family. And so, in fact, we do live in two two worlds because we have to survive in those two worlds. And to a certain extent, the Nia Ricans, the Puerto Ricans, came to New York and also to Newark and other you know, areas in and around New York City. You weren't white, you weren't black, and the mythology was of melting pot, but exactly. in a sense, you're the transition between the melting pot and the more pluralistic society, sort of this transnational going back and retaining elements of your language and culture. Yeah. I remember my parents, you gave up the language, and by the time the third generation, me, we didn't know the language at all, right. and there was no, I mean, we were Italian, but that's what we ate, but we weren't really culturally Italian, and it's Correct. different with you folks. Yeah, I think that we set the precedent for what we for future migrations, mm -hmm. and we really set a lot of precedents in terms of language, in terms of lifestyle, 
in terms of how we saw one another, and we refused to be pegged as black or white. And we could not be pegged as black and mm -hmm. white because you could look white and you might have a brother who looks black. Right. And, and you were white. Exactly. And so it was a very complicated issue. And I think that the Puerto Rican really suffered the scars of being the first, but, in, but set the, the Pioneers in a sense. We were pioneers of the population that we see now. But the, as you point out in the book, these issues of class and race and ethnicity were not only you to the outside world, but within the Puerto Rican community itself. I mean, when you went to Puerto Rico, it, it, it was different, and your treatment there was different as Puerto Ricans and as human beings. So yes. you I sort of caught time, on both ends. You're absolutely right. I think at that time, uh, Puerto Rico was going through so many changes the industrialization, it was a whole different consciousness. And all the, the things that happened in that kind of society were blamed on these New Yorkans who were coming in and they were changing everything. You know, we were bringing crime, supposedly. Uh, so every woe that they had in Puerto Rico was blamed on the New Yorkans. <laughs> and there was a real difference in, uh, there was a difference in culture, there was a difference in looking at things. And uh, there was more freedom, we had more freedom. So um, the title of the book, On Becoming New Yorkans, for me was um, very important because it really described the process of creating that identity. And that identity was, for me, was not really just Puerto Rican or American, but New Yorkan. And as Alma said, it, it, it's really um, relevant today because the kind of society that we have, the kind of... Uh, identities that um, we all go through, the, the young people are going through, are very connected to all these these languages, all these cultures. So to a certain extent, we did we were uh, we we did pave the way for this and understand the contemporary uh, New Yorkers from various places in exactly. a way that some of us might not. But certainly, all of us in the CUNY system experience this multiplicity of cultures exactly. on a daily <laughs> basis. Okay. Yes. So why do you two sisters who, very different kids, and we'll talk about that, grow up, end up in the same university, get a PhD in the same subject, and then decide to write a book? Why did you write the book, and how did you write the book? Why? Well, I wrote, I had an idea to write this book for many, many years. And I kept on trying to convince Angie to do it, and she had better things to do. Well, we'll, we'll talk about her party book. animal. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And, and so I finally convinced her, and I wanted to write the book because I thought that there were many books on Puerto Ricans out there. Perry Thomas's Down These Mean Streets, there was West Side Story, the, the La, Vida. La Vida, and there were a few others which basically did not depict my story, uh -huh. and I felt that, or our story, and I thought that our story was the story of many. It's not, of course, it's not going to be the same exact story, but we basically came from an intact family. We were, we had parents who were literate. We were educated in Catholic school. We came, we had a sense of community, and religion was very important. And none of these things came out in a lot of the other stories. There was a lot of drug addiction, gangs, a lot of violence, and we really were not exposed to all of that, or at least to the degree that it is depicted in different world, stories. different Absolutely. world, and also I think a different perspective. You bring in <clears throat> a woman's perspective, female perspective, in mm -hmm. the Peary Thomases and the La Vidas, were essentially men looking or men reporting on the experience. Yes. Talk about your early upbringing in the Patterson Projects in the Bronx. What was it like? How did you experience it as individuals and sisters? Well, there was a real sense of community in Patterson. And people were intertwined into one's lives in ways that I have never experienced before. We, we lived on the ninth floor of this building. There were, I believe, eight apartments on the floor. 
and the doors were kept open. We would be in and out of people's apartments. And everybody was your parent. Yes, I mean, yes that's true. Your, I mean, yes. your description on page 12 of this book, uh, we were a community and there was a shared sense of responsibility for the well-being of our neighbors. In a way, our project was like a village. Where I grew up in Woodhaven, in a very different e ethnic environment, mm -hmm. was the same way right. what you described. Doors were open. Everybody was responsible for you. If somebody told you to do it, you ate at other people's houses. So you've got these little villages within the city of these intact communities. What was, what was different? When did you realize that it wasn't like that in the rest of the world? What was it in your development? You move from the projects and you yes. go where? Uh, South Bronx also, but uh, a neighborhood that really wasn't as mixed. And um, actually, um, having to be bused into another Catholic school and then feeling like you're the only one. You feel very isolated. I didn't have that, even though I was always the only Hispanic. In, even in Catholic school, in, 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 uh, near the projects, um, really being conscious of it all of a sudden. Um, so you really develop your identity in contrast to, to yes. it out there rather than something that's inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You two are very different. I mean, you shared the same parents, the same home, the same culture, the same era, but you're different. And what's, what's striking in the book mm -hmm. is that you, Angie, you wanted to be a saint yes. and you wanted to be a lawyer. Did you turn out to be a saint? Oh, then no. you didn't turn out to I be married a one. <laughs> okay, so you, you married a lawyer or a saint? You married the lawyer, lawyer and right. you didn't turn out to be the saint. No. What, 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 what drove you as a kid? What was it that moved you on? Well, you know, it's interesting because you asked about um, why we wanted to write the book. And every time that Alma has answered, I would have a different answer totally. For example, uh, why did I write the book? Because she would have killed me if I hadn't. Uh, she was after me to do this and finally uh, she said, let's just write a proposal. And I figured, okay, we'll do the proposal. I gave her my word. Well, they accepted the proposal and then I got stuck. Then I had to do nice. it. Nice. Okay? Nice. You got so stuck. So my, my reason was not a lofty reason. Once I got into it, I felt that I had something to say. But I re I really didn't, it didn't start from a desire to make a contribution. And then she got divorced in the middle of the book, and she stopped fighting. <laughs> and then she, remember her uh, <laughs> standing over me, my office, on a Saturday, you're going to write <laughs> this chapter? And I would just, okay, you know, I would come out. But I, that wasn't my motivation. Or when you said my feeling about the, the projects. Um, it's true that there was a sense of community, but there was a lot of fear. Um, and I talk about us uh, being like the, the bulls that, uh, that they choose for the, um, um, for los toros, the, the bull fights. Bull fights. And uh, they, they choose the ones, they breed the ones that fight. And Alma is more the fighter, I'm more like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here, you know? <laughs> And um, so for me, growing up in the projects, even though we had community, there was a sense of fear. And my reaction to things, uh, not that she's not sensitive, uh, but I was like overly sensitive. And um, so... The more, she's the more practical one. You're yes. the more dreamy one. Yes. And I, uh, I think that from a very early age, I always was interested in why am I on this planet? What is this all about? Why was I sent here? Um, what am I supposed to do? And it was immediately in Catholic school, it was like, okay, I got it. I'm supposed to not be here. I'm working towards being over there. Oh, man. How was it being a sibling to somebody who wanted to go to heaven? It was horrible. <laughs> it was terrible because anything you did, you couldn't top that. Okay, yeah, okay, that's the other thing. She's a topic, what, being the, the, the second sister, if you will, of someone who's a top achiever, mm -hmm. what, what was that to you? I mean, what burdens did it place on? Well, what happened? Was there conflict here? Well, academically, what happens is you, you just, you're not going to compete. Because I'm not going to compete with a 98 average. 
So you met the enemy and you decided. That, that's fine. Right. You know, okay. have your 98 average. The problem was with the spiritual part. Because anything that, any normal <laughs> deviation or any normal thing that a teenager does, compared to someone who doesn't do anything bad, I was looked at as this, this, this terrible person. So it's not good, and, I, and, and when I <laughs> teach uh, my students, I tell them I shared for 18 years a room with Mother Teresa and Einstein together. Uh-uh, this uh, is with tough. A combination. And, and she's got the hair, the, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> not anyway, good. It's not true. Good. But it was hmm? terrible. I remember she had like a 95 on the geometry regions. And her, uh, the same teacher we had in high school who said, oh, that's good, but your sister got 100. Nice. So nice. they never encouraged her. And she felt for a long time that she wasn't um, intelligent, that she wasn't, um, you know, and that's not true. I was studious, but I think Alan was far more intelligent than I. Irrespective of that question, what, what struck me was the fact that you were always perceived to be the, the good Puerto Rican, the exception. Right. Yes. That yes. you were a model, and, and the burdens that that must have placed on both of you to sort of live, both live up to the ideal, but in a sense to be exposed to that type of thinking that you were unique among this community and everybody else, they were, you know, welfare and drugs and crime. Right. How did that affect you? Oh, that was very difficult because uh, you felt, um, and I think I speak to that, a lot of the work in ethnic identity formation that somehow it's, um, it's meant as a compliment, but it's such a, it's like you, uh, you, you know, considering who you are, Right, that you've done real that you've well. you've done very well. Yeah. How is that? I mean, I'll never mm. forget, when I was interviewed for my job at Baruch, um, one of the deans, who shall remain nameless, um, was just amazed. You were Phi Beta Kappa. How is that possible? How do you explain that? And I remember looking at uh, another person in the room who was who was also a dean but was uh, African American dean and I and I said I am sure you're not saying that it's impossible for Puerto Ricans to be Phi Beta Cap. He said when I said that he in his head she's hired. Right. You know. Right. But that kind of thing that somehow um, you know, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Yeah. It's, it still it's happens. It still happens. I remember So we're we're not talking about history here. We're talking about it also existing, at least in a modified form, even today. Oh, absolutely. I remember coming up for tenure and having um, a dean look at my folder and reading an article that I wrote. I co-wrote with a distinguished professor, and her asking me, what was the process of writing this article? And I couldn't understand what she was saying. What do you mean the process? I said, well, we would meet once a week to read no, she wanted the article. you to say, you know, that he wrote it and you did and the basically, one. basically, I didn't know what she was saying. And then she said, well, who was the last person to have that article before it was mailed to the publisher? And I had to think about it. I said, oh, he, he took the article and, and sent it out because there was some um, changes that he had to make to, to the article. She said, I knew that that was not your writing. Oh. So she and was I, looking for the fact that you couldn't, so, so, you, so there's this feeling out there or this, this attitude that you couldn't do it. Now, your reaction was, damn it, I'm gonna do it, both of you? I think there's a part of me that I really lived, uh, you know, that, yeah. I can't do it. It was always oh. a part of me that I think that I shrunk, just ah. like the the bull who pulls back. Yeah, right. that's true. I I really can't do that, and uh, I I'm not. I've never been all that ambitious, believe it or not. And um, they, I think, you know, given um, the opportunities when I first started, I could have done many things, and somehow I never really felt that I could do it. I left 
foreigners, really feeling that I really wasn't meant to, to graduate. This is undergraduate school. Undergraduate. I started a foreigner and I had a you know scholarship. But somehow I felt that I couldn't, I didn't belong there. How, you know, and, and, and I remember, um, you're Puerto Rican. That's why you got a scholarship. Uh, and I thought you were intelligent. Oh, you know, uh, and that right. kind of thing that somehow the self-fulfilling prophecy, somehow I felt like I don't belong here. So did yeah. the negative, the negative psycholo psychological impact of affirmative action, if you will. Yeah, in some ways it was counter to that. Right. And, and it's interesting that I ended up working in the C program, which I've never left. Uh, and it was a program that wasn't really part of the mainstream. It was almost as if it was a segregated group for a long time. It's much more integrated now. But in those days, we were, oh, we were bringing down the standards. Every, they're changing the university. And somehow we, we, we were always parallel to the institution, never quite part of the institution. And I felt, you know, it, I never had... Um, a burning desire to, to sort of, okay, let me move in. Right. But, uh, but in fact, your, your background, your history, your biography almost led you to the place where you could best understand the students that you dealt with. Because yes, they, absolutely. they, to absolutely. a certain extent, were you. Absolutely. And you as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. One of the things that struck me, and I guess the, all of us who went to Catholic school, whenever we meet, <laughs> there is this bond and of experience. And you, on page 35, most of the successful Puerto Ricans of my generation attended that Catholic school. And in fact, your second chapter is called Nuns with Bad Habits. What was it about Catholic school education for us as individuals, but almost generationally, what, it, what did it mean? How did it work? And why, why didn't it work? Why did it work and how didn't it work? What, what was it? I mean, you, you people are the educational development people. And is there anything that we can learn from that in terms of larger approaches to school? Well, I think that in Catholic school, and I think they still do this a lot, they teach to the norm, to, to the average student, and you expect it to learn. So the expectations, expectations were there. The expectation is there. And, th and that really, you could learn. Yes. And that you can learn. You have to learn. You better learn. <laughs> you better okay. learn. Right. And you you've got scores and I've got scores Absolutely. to prove it. Okay, you, you understand learn, this. You better learn because if not, you're going to be out of there. And, and so you learn. And now the problem with that is if you're very, very bright, it becomes very boring. Right. If, you're ve if you have learning disabilities, or you have some kind of learning problem, then you are being expected to do something you cannot, or you need a different strategy or whatever. So that's the problem. But the expectation and the discipline, there is no time wasted telling students to be quiet or to Because you were discipline. terrified. You yes. Were terrified. Excuse me, I mean, you, you know. Were, you were terrified. And there's a lot of things now in the public school system that these teachers have to fill out forms and all this bureaucracy. Alan was right. There was a seamless day. There was a constant activity. Well, I so, remember in my fifth grade, as I was telling you, we had 85 kids in the class. <laughs> we double sat, and in the winter, we had wooden boards, and we would sit on the radiators, and we would switch at the and and they had perfect control. Now we didn't have art, we didn't have music, we didn't have any ancillary stuff. History was, you know, <laughs> priests and and the exactly. history of priests and nuns. We didn't know anything about the rest of the world, but we all learned the basics. We learned yes. how to read, we learned yes. how to take yes. notes, we learned how to organize. So there were pluses. Is there anything in that experience that can be you know, generalize that. What is it about our current system that's lacking? And is there, was there anything in your experience that would lead to something different and better? I mean, you're the educational development I, people. I, well, I think, think the, the bureaucracy, uh, you, you know, is, is dreadful. And I think also stick to something that works rather than constantly, every couple of years, changing what you're doing. We learn through phonics, and we learn how to read. I'm not saying that phonics is the only strategy, but if you know that works, why throw it out and bring something else 
that might or might not. I mean, that's just an example. Right. But there are things, and, and, and homework. Yes. We were given homework. And we had to be signed off by parents. Oh, it was please. a big involvement yeah, right. with, with, with the parents. Oh. And structure. You know, uh, I think children like structure. And there was something about um, that in the morning you did this, and in the mid-morning you did that. Um, predictability. Predictability. I know that uh, we would have to read out loud poems. We did the same thing. And, but, you know, to this day, I know some of these poems. And you could repeat them for a bit. And you can repeat every yes. preposition from yes. on, above. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. And to this day, you know, when I have difficulty with a sentence, I, I kind of diagram it in my mind to, to make sure that I'm, you know, I, I never have run-on sentences, you know. <laughs> I, I don't because have your, knuckles, your yes. knuckles hurt. Okay. So you but made... Then, you, the negative, but there's a lot of no, negatives. Okay, too. Give, give, give some negatives, and then this half well, hour is gone. Well, the vomiting every morning before you, <laughs> you had to go to school. Right. Well, I, I, that, that I did. I, I did throw up in the mornings. But one of the things that you learned very quickly was not to really ask questions. Because if you were bright and you started asking, well, wait a minute, I don't get this. You mean that if I, uh, I'm going to go to hell? if I don't go to church on Sunday. But if I kill somebody on a Friday and I confess it on a Saturday, uh -oh. I may have a chance uh -oh. of... Uh-oh, now we're going to get... Oh, with these that was the very theological confused. discussions. So I here. would get into these theological discussions in the third, fourth grade and ask questions that after a while it was faith. And what I really got as a child, faith meant keep quiet, go with the program, you're irritating the son, you can be the next one to be hit. So you don't have that inquiry, you don't have that, that, that you know, the curiosity, the, the dialogue is, 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 you know, squelched. I can't believe that we've really run through 26 and a half minutes. What's the next book? What do you guys do next? We don't know because we have children, <laughs> and uh, we went up to the twenties. It was kind right. of insane. Yeah, no, I, I got to ask this after question. The 20s, I know what, why. Why does it end at the twenties? Why not after the twenties? Because we have children, Meaning? and we're, and we're protecting the, the guilty. Oh, wait a minute! I mean, you, there were things that you could write that you couldn't put in here about you. Oh yes. Almost Your said well, I'm a life. well, I was a, a disco queen. I had a whole thing there with the disco queen. Look, we're the same generation. We were hippies. Uh -oh. we kind of cool. So the well, next book is the true story. Well, this is true too. No, no, no. This no. is another the true piece. adult story. Well, well, maybe we're. You know, we may have to do this anonymously or something. <laughs> this is it. I'm on. I'm your manager. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah,